Um, and then we're going to start today with some phrases on this big screen. And I want you to read through some of them. Privacy is dead. Could be like, only terrorists want privacy. That's a very nice one from my home country of the United States. Um, I don't care, they have my data anyways. It was already shared. Maybe young people don't care about privacy anymore. Why should we implement it? Has anybody heard any of these things? Has anybody said any of these things? That's okay, no shame. There's no shaming here. We're talking about privacy. And I think these are real experiences of people because I think the vibe around privacy in a lot of ways is quite cynical. There's a massive amount of data that's available. There's programs, for example, 10 years ago that Snowden brought to light, but that were kind of well known in some parts of the industry beforehand about the amount of privacy offered to individuals. And there's a massive amount of data collection and use in our lives today. So I really mean it when I say I don't want to shame these points of view. I think this is a real feeling and I think it can show us a condition that exists in our world today. How many people here are from Amsterdam or the Netherlands as a, a larger group? Did you hear about the fraud algorithm that came up recently in the news around social services? I'm, I'm seeing some nodding. So there's a fraud algorithm. Fraud is important to track, and usually we use machine learning now to do it. My background's in machine learning, so I've had a chance to work on and see lots of fraud systems implemented. And the fraud system that was implemented was supposed to track potential social security or social services fraud um, for applicants. So you would apply for social services or some sort of social programs, and this algorithm or the model and system that was used to create and then evaluate these applications, which used some level of machine learning, would tell you whether it's fraud or not. Now, this was implemented by a large consultancy, not the one I work at. This was implemented by a large consultancy for the, uh, the Dutch state. And um, what was found in the feature set, so in some of the variables that were used essentially to train the algorithm, was that Dutch nationality was a key feature flag and that this feature flag was then uh, a, a key decider of the rate of fraud for the people that were applying to these systems. So, the question is here, what does this have to do with privacy? Any guesses? What if nationality wasn't shared? What if we just didn't train a model using nationality as a feature? What if somebody in the room said, you know, I think that's private information, I don't necessarily know if it's relevant or not to the outcomes. What if somebody said, we need to mask this in some way so that it's not a one zero. What if somebody had said, let's ask the users if they'd like to share their nationality as part of their form, and so on and so forth. There's any number of things that could have been done that would probably provide also better outcomes for the algorithm, because it's quite a lazy evaluation from an information gain point of view to use nationality as an indicator of fraud. It's just bad data science. So maybe now we see, ah, if data privacy exists in software and systems, maybe we also have more humane outcomes, maybe we also have better outcomes, maybe we have less of this privacy cynicism. But first we actually need to define data privacy because it's kind of this big amorphous experience. And the reason why it's so big and amorphous is, is way bigger than just the technical side, it's way bigger than just the legal side, it's also the social and cultural and individual experiences of humans. And I think this is a big reason why in the EU it's defined as a human right. And it's defined as a human right in the conventions that were put together after the end of World War II. And that's, this is not, this is very linked to the way that the Nazi regime operated, right? Is data privacy as a human right. So when we think about all of these different definitions, we can see, I tried to make the the circles overlapping in the ways that I see them, but also overlapping in their size. So I think socially, culturally, historically, we have a lot more ideas about privacy than the legal implications of privacy. That's a lived experience. We have ways that we talk to each other and we communicate, hey, this is just between us, 
or hey, can you go actually tell all these people that I'm saying this? If I'm standing here in the center of town and I'm screaming, I obviously have a different idea about the context and the privacy of that information than if I pull you aside and I'm whispering to you something. Right, so all of these social and cultural experiences and the ways, the cues of how we talk about the context of the information that we share, they're really obvious to us in a real world. And where some of the shift that's difficult is how we put it into a technical world. So first we have to put it into a legal world, and that's the definition of data protection or the legal definitions. Those are obviously then codified into law, regulations, maybe policies or standards at an organization that you're working at, and they have their own language around data privacy that is also divergent from maybe the way that you and I would commonly talk about data privacy. And then we have a growing field of scientific or technical definitions of privacy that tries to figure out how do we take these legal concepts, how do we take these social concepts, and how do we define them in code? And that is a lot of what I've spent the past uh, five, six years of my career working on, is how do we actually take and use these scientific and technical definitions of privacy and make sure that we find this nice overlap between the legal side and also the cultural, social, and hopefully individual side of privacy. So that might be kind of complicated, right? Like that's a lot of things. I don't know if we can represent society in code. Yes, I agree with you. Um, so how do we actually implement privacy in code systems and particularly in data workflows? First off here, how many people here are from data science, machine learning, data engineering, data management side of the house? Okay, not very. How many folks here are like software, systems, architects, ops, okay, okay. That uh, will help me, so if I say machine learning -y stuff and you're like, what is that? That's a great question, so um, you can add it. Um, obviously, my background's in machine learning, so I would try to make sure that the way that I'm speaking is uh, friendly to everybody. So the start of my book and some of what we'll go through today is kind of a whirlwind tour of my book, but the start of my book says you can't do any of the cool data privacy stuff and you probably can't reach any realm of satisfiable privacy from a user perspective and even from an organizational perspective if you don't first start with the foundations, which is data governance. So what is data governance? It's multidisciplinary. It often has actors from maybe Audit compliance, if you're at a large enough place or if you're at a bank or other highly regulated industry. It also has to do with the different data owners, so data managers, data owners, data architects. It also has to obviously do with technological governance. So this might be your software, this might be your software architecture, this might be your operating environment or what cloud you use and so forth. And then it also has to do with privacy team, legal team, infosec team. And so really it's spanning across a bunch of parts of the organization, pretty much anybody that's responsible for making decisions about data, how it's collected, how it's used, how it's retained, and how it's deleted. And data governance spans way beyond data privacy and data security, MySpace. It also can talk about data quality. It can talk about data consistency. It can talk about data interoperability, and so on and so forth. Data modeling also falls under this as well. And so uh, this is a graphic that's used uh, by my employer, ThoughtWorks, uh, that we use to talk about all of these different overarching and interchangeable pieces of governance, of which, of course, privacy is a core part. And it's really important that all these people are making decisions because if you don't set policies and standards that make sense across the entire organization and that fit, for example, the organization's risk appetite, organization's liability, organizations, uh, operating regions, and the variety of regulations, you end up in a real pickle, let's say, about figuring out how you're going to actually implement privacy. So at the end of the day, it needs to be a, a group decision, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's say you've done this data governance, you have some people decisions, you have some process decisions, and you have some technical decisions, and you now have this mandate, okay, go implement this new product with these new privacy features. How is that gonna work, right? So at the end of the day, you have maybe these very organizational, very process-driven, very regulatory-driven ideas, but 
in the beginning of my talk, I talked about humans and human rights and human choice. So we need to kind of build a bridge here between these organizational demands and requirements and the human side of privacy. So one of the things that I talk about in the book that in case you work with the product side of the house or the UI UX side of the house or even user research side of the house is to think about new ways that you allow the user to interface and communicate with you about privacy preferences. And it certainly does not look like the annoying cookie banners that we have experienced for the past five years. It certainly looks different than that. And so there are ways where you can talk with your users, where you can even run non-scalable user research or A, B, C, D, E, F testing, where you can start to actually interface and provide options. And the area of product design com compliant with privacy by design and the area of user interface design with focus on privacy, it's as old as technology itself. Some of the landmark papers are still from the 90s. And so there's no dearth of information about how to actively ask and maybe even learn and infer ways to talk with users about their privacy preferences. And nowhere is this more apparent today in product development than the way that Apple talks to users about privacy. We can argue about why Apple talks to users about privacy and what does it mean, but we definitely see in the privacy interfaces that Apple says, this app wants to use this, do you want to allow them, do you want to allow them for a short period of time, all of these things. If we built more of these into the applications themselves, users might be more willing to share information because they have choice and they have transparency. So that data is kind of, I would say, at the edge, right? It's on the software, it's on the device, so the application is in the web interface. And then from a data engineering, and also from just a systems engineering point of view, we have to take that data, we have to put it someplace that people are going to use it. That's the kind of the whole point. And so, um, although I'm a big fan of local first data, so if you're at uh, Martin uh, Kleppman's talk, I'm definitely gonna expand upon those ideas in a minute. But when we do so, so we have some user interface, we have some consent interface, we can add additional lineage and governance information as we collect data. This shouldn't be throwaway metadata, this should be data that we value, that we use to enhance the decisions that we make around governance. We can do pipeline stuff, we can transport, we can modify and so forth. We might wanna also assess quality and make quality decisions before we store. And then we're also gonna address sensitivity concerns. And so when we address these sensitivity concerns on ingestion, or maybe if you have a multi-stage data area, you might do it between different stages of your data zones, or your data mesh, or your data fabric, or your lake house, or whatever it is that you'd like to call it. But you might apply these transformations in different steps. And if you're doing this at a, a highly regulated industry, or even if you're thinking a lot about data privacy and data security, you might actually start zoning certain data that has had very little sensitivity protections in separate zones from other data, right? And so you need to really actually start thinking about how you architect things and where the most sensitive data is stored and where data is stored that everybody or more people can access that has more privacy protections applied to it. We'll get to those protections later. But then you should be able to access the data without doing five join jumps to the information about the sensitivity, to the information about the consent, to the information about any other governance criteria that you'd like to attach. And this is because Technically, with GDPR and other regulations that are coming into effect, the consent that is attached to the data when you collect it is exactly the only consent that that data can be used under. We like to talk about there's an, a concept of legitimate interest, and you might have heard of this, but what has been shown by CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority, is they are shrinking the space of legitimate interest. So from a basic compliance point of view, it's very important that you know under what consent terms data was collected so that things like data retention or things like use cases can be properly tracked. So what might be some of these things that you can do? 
So let's get into a little bit more of the technical side of things. The first and the most basic and the thing that probably hopefully you're already all using right now is pseudonymization. So pseudonymization, we take sensitive information, usually this is PII or personally identifiable information, and we change it slightly. We don't change a lot of it, um, and we use particular methods, and the methods that you use will vary in their privacy protections, but that's what we do from a very basic, this is the most basic of techniques that you can do. It offers, though, some protections. So we can think about format-preserving encryption, where we also increase utility of the data because we keep it in a format that the data user is expecting. And yet, we, uh, and we also allow for decryption of that. So if you use encryption basics there, um, that's a field I used to work in. I'm happy to talk about it further. Um, but you can also do things that are non-reversible, like hashing. You could do table-based tokenization, which is questionable of scale, but to each their own. You can do masking, or you can even do redaction. So all of these are techniques that are available to you, and they offer some baseline support for saying, OK, maybe this PII shouldn't end up in this easily accessible bucket or something like this. But they don't offer you a lot of protection. So pseudonymization, I would say, is like the very base lowest amount of protection, and that's because it's quite easy to take a bunch of pseudonymized information to link it all together, which is probably why you're pseudonymizing it, is you want it to be linkable, to link it all together, and then to kind of reverse engineer or single out individuals and be able to figure out who they are. This is a known attack. It's happened time and time again. This is why every time I say when people say like, we anonymize the data and then they release it, it's like, oof, you really just probably shouldn't say that unless you're ready um, for uh, a security attack, basically, or a privacy attack. So uh, this is well known by the folks that run and release public records every day. So the, the US Census, uh, is a, a way of tracking information about US residents and citizens. Um, there's about 330 million of them, plus more over time, or maybe less, depending on uh, the month. But for that reason, uh, they need to release statistics, and a lot of these statistics are used to make decisions about funding. They're used to make decisions about healthcare programs, about educational programs, and so on and so forth. And these decisions have real meaning, but they're also always publicly released. And so I'm from the US, I used to work there, and there was lots of clever ways, let's just say, that data scientists would take these statistics and use them to enrich the data and potentially combine it with enough data that they could actually connect individuals in their consumer databases with individuals released in the census data. And this was based on some older techniques that the census used in 2010 and before. The census kind of got wind of this and they actually performed their own database reconstruction attack and they found that half of the people were able to be reconstructed in some of the areas using openly accessible consumer databases you can buy for like 50 bucks because data privacy in America. Um, so because of this, the US Census was like, maybe we should do something more rigorous this time. And they decided to go with differential privacy. Now, how many people have already heard about differential privacy? One. Sorry, zero, two, three. I'm making a differentially private response. You get the joke. All right. Um, so differential privacy is a way of essentially removing outliers and inserting error. Why would we want to do that? If, if we add noise, we can never be exactly certain what the actual answer is. 
And unfortunately, I'm here to break it to you. Um, if anybody ever told you that they could digitize something and it's anonymous, they lied to you. They probably didn't mean to lie to you. They probably actually thought that was possible, but it's mathematically infeasible. It's been proven now in research for decades. There is no way to collect information, release information, and guarantee anonymity in any dictionary sense of the word of anonymity. It's literally against the principles of information theory. So, if you want to argue information theory, good job, but essentially there's no such thing as anonymity from a technical point of view, and since there's no such thing as anonymity, what was suggested as a replacement is the core concept that form differential privacy, and it's exactly based on this, is the closest thing we can get to anonymity because it allows us to reason about the amount of information that we're releasing, and when we reason about the amount of information we're releasing, we can can actually decide to lessen the amount of information or abstract the amount of information by doing things like adding noise, by doing things like removing outliers because they have a lot of information compared to the others. They have an increased privacy risk if you're an outlier. And this is exactly the types of probabilistic and statistical methods that we need if we're going to get anywhere near what any human would think of as anonymity. So that's what they did. They have the histograms that are based on the real numbers. They added a noise barrier. They used a library that I talk about in the book called Tumult Analytics, which runs on Spark, if you're familiar with it. And then they did some correction, post-processing correction, so that everything ended up. And that's how they released, actually, the entire 2020 census numbers. You can read more about it, both in the book, but also they have a bunch of cool blog posts on the topic. And this gets us to the idea that privacy and information are linked, right? Like information theory tells us a lot about privacy theory and privacy risk, and it is like a mathematical understanding of privacy, right? And so when we think of privacy and information, we can think of an entire continuum. And the more information that we give, the less privacy we can guarantee is by no means a zero, one, or a binary situation. This isn't an on, off, you can't just turn on or off privacy. This is instead an entire continuum where you're constantly making choices about how much privacy you can offer and what's the trade-off with information. And this, by the way, it's not meant to be linear. I had to do linear because it's gotta go in a book and you can't do non-linear in a book, unfortunately. But the idea is that different techniques that you can use can offer different um, amounts of this trade-off. And you can tune this trade-off over time. And it should be driven not only by the privacy of the individuals, but also by the context, the use case, the risk of how you're releasing data. Obviously, if you're dealing with internal data in an internal use case, it's a massively different risk than if you're releasing data to the public. So you might be like, this is complicated. I don't want to learn about your math, Catherine. Uh, you're making me bored thinking about probability. So um, what about ways where I don't have to think about these things like differential privacy? I don't really want to think about this. Yes. Now we connect to Martin Kleppmann's talk. So what if we said, OK, this sounds like a lot of risk. We don't want to collect this data. What if we just didn't collect the data? How many people here have made that argument at their work at some point in time? Let's just not collect it. Yes, awesome, thank you. Privacy champions, yes. Keep doing that, regardless of what you learn in this talk. Um, but one of the ways that we can think about high-risk data, or even just think about optimizing our data systems, is to leave more data at the edge and to push compute and processing to the edge instead of sucking data to the center. This is one of the core theories behind federated learning, which was first built and deployed at scale by Google, because they were having a lot of trouble doing machine learning on predictive text on keyboards. This was, I think, in 2016, 2017. And they noticed that the performance of their predictive keyboard, particularly for non-native English speakers, so if your native keyboard language is not English, that in certain languages in particular, they were doing quite poorly. And I imagine here we have some speakers who have experienced this lovely 
problem uh, in real life where the next word that's predicted has literally nothing to do with anything or is spelled wrong or is a totally different conjugation and, 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 right? So what Google said is, you know, it'd be really useful if we had more keyboard data, more text data in other languages. And I'm certain somebody in the room, I wasn't there, but somebody in the room, I'm sure was like, let's just start collecting all keyboard data. <laughs> Thankfully, somebody intervened. It was like, I think that's super creepy and probably illegal. So they went this way. And the way that they did is they said, you know what, we're actually, devices are getting strong enough, we can do machine learning on the device. So instead of collecting all the data centrally, we're gonna push the machine learning to the devices and then we're gonna do machine learning there. How does that even work? So I wanna take you through it and I won't get into too much of the boring machine learning details, but the idea is you push the model to the devices or parts of the model, depending on how your model is architected. You then actually run training or some types of learning on the device. At some point in time, you have what we call an update. The update is either a gradient or a tensor, or it's some collection of weights, representation of weights of the model. That gets aggregated at an aggregation step here, and then the aggregator makes some sort of algorithm or decision, and here we can also think about adding differential privacy. We can also do other things at this step. And an uh, end decision is made, and that update is sent not only to the centralized model, but then all the end device models, and you can repeat this as many times as you want. So this offers a lot of privacy principles because the data is not centralized, but I must say, and I want to do big asterisk, it depends on the implementation, how much privacy we can guarantee of this. Because sometimes the updates that users send, particularly if they're outliers, they might actually leak information. But we can move beyond just machine learning, we can actually do this in any type of data querying, data analysis, data collection, and so forth. We can actually push all of that processing to the edge. And I have seen and worked on a lot of even sensor data, um, uh, factory floor data, and so forth, where you actually don't want to aggregate all that data, especially if you're just gonna run three queries or some sort of predictive maintenance, um, if else statement, basically, and make a decision. So I agree in terms of the local first of the data, we should probably, for some types of data, we should be thinking more about aggregating and pushing queries and analysis to the edge and not sifting in terabytes of data per day that nobody ever uses or looks at. Not only for the privacy principles, but for green computing and so on and so forth. So, what you might be thinking if you work in data sharing is this sounds like it could apply to that as well. And you might be thinking, how is that gonna work if we need to aggregate across certain types of our data? I don't see how this can work. And if you get to this stage, you start then moving into my favorite part of the field, which is cryptography. So private set intersection is deployed and actively used by Google Ads. And has anybody here studied cryptography before or is a cryptographer or works close with cryptographers? Yeah, awesome, excellent. You also enjoy differential privacy, some of the same core principles of pseudo-randomness. And so private set intersection is a branch of a subfield of cryptography called encrypted computation. And what private set intersection does is it creates protocols that allow us to compare two sets of data and to only find the set, the intersection. And we can do this all in cryptography. We can actually use Diffie-Hellman style protocols. This is like very old cryptography. It's not anything new or super fancy. What's new and fancy is that we can do this for imbalanced data sets at scale and we can do this in optimized ways and so on and so forth. And so Google already runs this in production for some time. And we can look, they can look at things like users who clicked an ad and users who bought something. They can find this intersection and then they continue computing on that and release, let's say, ROI on ads and so on and so forth. And they do this without centralizing the data. So again, it has these federated principles. And part of what they do uh, in the current way that they operate this, as far as my understanding, as well as their published research on the topic, is they also remain in encrypted space to compute. So they actually never decrypt the data to perform the computations. And then at the end of the computation, they can determine who and where gets to decrypt. 
And this isn't necessarily privacy. This is actually starts bordering on what cryptographers call privacy, which is secrecy. And secrecy is the ability to decide when encrypted information and by whom uh, this is allowed to be decrypted. And so we can start to build these principles together where cryptography can help increase secrecy and we can use secrecy in clever ways to add privacy and these can support one another in very holistic ways. And it goes even beyond that. So uh, I used to work in the field of encrypted machine learning um, and in encrypted machine learning, what we're doing is we're actually sharing encrypted data across multiple organizations. We're doing so, or at least the, the place I worked at, did multi-party computation. And in this case, you might have heard of secret sharing or Shamir's secret sharing. And in this, we're able to learn on encrypted data. We're able to learn on distributed data where only ever encrypted tensors are shared. And we're also able to do things like secure and private aggregation where these aggregation steps or syncs across the machine learning can do clever things with differential privacy, can do clever things with deciding who gets the decrypted updates, and so on and so forth. So I share this in the sense that you can start to build these concepts with each other, and this is why it's so important to understand where do you actually fit on the risk continuum, where do you fit on the privacy and information continuum, and so on. So I hope maybe I've taught you a few concepts that might be new to you. Um, practical data privacy, especially implementing this, taking it from theory and labs and implementing it into working software is a team sport. There's no way that any of this can be done by only one team. Here's just a few of the teams and how they might interact with each other. And there's also a growing field called privacy engineering that um, I have some YouTube videos in a series on um, if you're interested in learning more about specializing just in privacy technology. But I think that this could be implemented at any scale, at any organization, and I'd be happy to talk about that further. To wrap up today, I think I wanna share with you that privacy doesn't have to be dead, that privacy very much is a privilege, and that different people have different access to privacy that privacy is powerful, that it allows people to decide who they are, who they want to be online, it allows people to change their mind, it allows people to determine what context they're operating in, it can have ethical, social, cultural benefits, and it could also be super fun math, lots of cryptography, lots of uh, statistical thinking, and it can be also implementing those at scale, which means a lot, lot, lot of software and operations, infrastructure, and so on. And I think is a good way to think about how do we implement human rights in technology. So I want to thank you very much. This is my book. Uh, I have my newsletter, probably private, and you can reach out to me on these. I don't know how much longer I'll be on Twitter, but for now I'm still there. And I want to thank you so much for your time. <laughs>